Give him the praise. Jesus, we worship you this morning. We praise you. We thank you. We bless you. For you are worthy to be praised. You are the lamb that was slain, that overcame sin and death, that all that call upon the name of Jesus shall be saved and tens upon tens of thousands of angels will stand before the throne of God and the 24 elders fell down and they said, worthy is the lamb. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who took the sin of the world upon himself and freed mankind from his sins. And he holds the keys to death in Hades. And the Bible says all who call upon his name shall be freed from sin and he will break the chain and he will come inside and give his Holy Spirit and you can be set free today. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Worthy is Jesus. Worthy is the name that was slain. And the Bible says that when we get to heaven, he shall wipe the very tears from your eyes and there will be no evil and there will be no suffering and there will be no addiction for my Jesus says he will give us a new heart and a new start and a new spirit that all who call upon his name, not because they deserve it, not because of the works that they've done, but because of the faith in the one that stepped out of heaven and came down to the earth and was nailed to a wooden cross like this and said, if you ever want to know if God loves you, look to the cross because on that cross he looked out and said forgive them for they know not what to do. That's how much Jesus loves you. He wants to set you free today. Can I get an amen? Amen. I didn't come to church, y'all, just to come into a church building this morning. I've been praying. I've been fasting. I was up last night reading in the book of Acts, and I said, oh, Jesus, like the prophet Joel said in the book of Acts, when Peter was quoting the prophet Joel, he said, are y'all ready for this? In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit On all people, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I don't know about you, but here's what I want. I want the Holy Spirit to speak to us today. Can I get a holy holy amen? This is a real Jesus. This isn't just a building or a religion or a Bible or a good Christian song. This is a real living Jesus that wants to encounter you today who is here Because my Bible says we're two or more gathered in the name of Jesus. There am I also. Are you ready to meet Jesus today? Because whether or not we've trusted in him yet, this could be your day of salvation. Or whether or not we have believed in Jesus. But that fire in our hearts has been squashed by some care of the world. Some sin that's entered our life. Let me tell you something. If you need to hear this good news, those of you who are watching online, those of you who are watching from Uganda, those who are in this room. There is nothing, and I repeat nothing, that Jesus cannot forgive. And there is no addiction and no sin and no family sins in your household that Jesus can't set you free from. My Jesus is a chain breaker and he's come to set you free. Can I get an amen today? This is the Jesus that we're talking about today. And I'm so excited to have the opportunity. I've prayed, I've fasted, I've been in this room this week and I just started to pray for some of you by name and I prayed for those of you that I don't even know that somehow today we would have an encounter with the real Jesus. I just can't get over it. 17 years ago, In two days, 17 years ago and two days ago, I was in ministry, and I had grown up in religion. I don't know about you, but maybe there's some of you that when you come from a religious background, it probably messed a lot of us up in our viewpoint of God. I don't know if you can relate to that, but in my household, God was so far away. I was taught that God only loved some people that he had not died for the sins of all mankind. You just hoped that you were one of the lucky few. And so I had this whole thing, the stained glass windows and the pipe organ, and I kept hearing about God, but I never saw freedom in Jesus. I never understood that there was a real living Jesus that wanted a relationship with me, what the Bible says. He knits you together in your mother's womb. He lives to intercede for you. He wants you to come home, and through that cross, there is life, eternal life, for all who want to call on him. He says to the thirsty come and drink some water that I want to give you and you will never thirst again are you thirsty today Jesus is what you're looking for he is who you're looking for 
My wife married me thinking that I was a Christian. Her dad, a spirit-filled Baptist preacher and evangelist who had been called at the age of 27, gave his life to ministry, led hundreds of people to the Lord, went to seminary, and his passion was carrying the cross through every town that he served in uh, around Easter to show people that there was a living Jesus that wanted to know him and he would evangelize. That's the kind of dad my wife grew up with, my father-in-law, John. And so he had asked me when I, when I, when I wanted to marry Gina because we fell in love, um, I knew everything to say. Because when you grow up in church and you say you believe, a lot of people believe it here, but Jesus isn't in here. That was me. I'm just telling you that was my story. I knew the Bible. I would have said I believed in Jesus. I would have said I believe that there's a heaven. I believe he died on the cross. But the question was not do you know about Jesus, Thomas? Do you know Jesus? Have you been born again? Has his Holy Spirit come inside of you and forgiven everything? And Jesus, I'm going to tell you straight up because this is who I was. He was not the Lord of my life. I loved alcohol more than Jesus. My mouth was terrible. I treated my wife terribly. I was not a servant of God. I didn't lead us in the word of God in our marriage. I didn't pray for her. I was a terrible person to live with. I had addictions. I had religious views of God that were incorrect. And my wife would used to say to me, she goes, Thomas, don't you know that Jesus died for the sins of all mankind? And I said, no, he didn't. He didn't do that. That's a shallow gospel. My heart was hardened you ever grow up in a church? I talked to somebody in the hospital one day when my, when my son, Jonathan, was in the hospital. It was a nurse, and she, I said, um, you know, this little guy's a miracle. He's a little miracle man, the fact that he's even here, whole story behind that. But um, I said, what, did, what do you think about God? She goes, man, I'll tell you what. I grew up in a church where all I was told is I'm going to burn in hell forever, that I was unworthy, that I would never amount to anything, and that God is probably going to cast me into hell that he's here to condemn me. I said, man, I'm so sorry that you had to experience that. Can I tell you about the real Jesus? The Jesus that loves you, that knit you together in your mother's womb. You're fearfully and wonderfully made, and he wants to know you personally, and his name is Jesus, and he died on a cross, and he was buried, and he rose again from the dead, and you know he loves you. He's not here to condemn you. In fact, Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Can I get an amen? amen. Yo, this is good news. This isn't, this isn't about a church building or, or, or my notes here or, or just the word. This is about a living Jesus that wants to encounter you today right where you are. Jesus wants to meet you today. He wants to speak to you. He does not want you to leave this auditorium the same way that you came in. He wants you to be filled with the Spirit of God. He wants you to know that you have eternal life, and he wants you to carry a message that this world so desperately needs because they're trying to fill their lives with everything but Jesus. And the truth of the matter is, and what I had to come to the conclusion, I'm going to tell you about in a second, is that Jesus is the only one that can fulfill the void in your heart. Can I get an amen? That's the truth. So my wife's married to me. I'm in full-time ministry. I am an ordained minister. And Gina begins to see that what I said uh, when I asked for a hand in marriage, my father-in-law who loves Jesus, filled with the Spirit, Baptist minister for over 47 years, he looked me in the eye and said, Thomas, do you love Jesus with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? I said, yes. Would you give your life for him? I said, yes. Do you love my daughter with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? I said, yes, I do. Would you give your life for her? Yes. Now, in my heart, I really thought I was telling the truth but not long after we were married, Gina began to look at my life. I was a total hypocrite. I was out drinking on the weekends, and I didn't drink just to drink to have fun. I drank to really drink and to get drunk. I had a problem. I have alcoholics on both sides of my family. I was headed in that direction. I love that more. I was out gambling. I was out hanging out with business. And then on Sunday, I put my church clothes on, and I tried to play church. And y'all, that ain't Christianity. That ain't Christianity. So she calls her daddy, daddy, I think Thomas is lost. I don't think he knows Jesus. And even though he's an ordained minister and he goes to church every week and we drive in a car and go to church, I don't think he knows him. And this is what John said. He's sitting in this room right now. John said, full of the Holy Spirit, he goes, you know what, Gina? We're going to start praying for Thomas to get saved. He needs to have an encounter with the real Jesus. She says, Dad, I talk to him all the time about God's unconditional love for every single person in the world, but he just doesn't believe it. And the more I talk to him about it, the meaner he gets, cursing out of his mouth. 
problems with alcohol, problems with lust, problems with all kinds of sin, stooped in sin, claiming to be a Christian, but I lacked the power thereof. I didn't have Jesus in my life. I didn't even know it. And so in, on April 22nd, 2005, Gina says, would you come with me to hear an evangelist named Greg Laurie? He has a movie out now called Jesus Revolution. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. So Greg Laurie was preaching in Athens, Georgia. We drive there. She said, I just want you to listen to him. And I heard Greg get up. He has a powerful testimony of being on drugs and coming out of that and becoming an evangelist, led millions of people to Jesus. The dude just loves Jesus, and he wants other people to know Jesus. So I hear Greg Laurie, and I'm listening to it going, dang, this sounds different than the Jesus that I grew up with. This Jesus sounds like he loves everybody, but under my breath, I was like, no, 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 no. He doesn't, because that's not what I was taught when I grew up. But my wife was praying that I would go forward during the invitation to get saved, but my heart became even more hardened. She kept calling her parents. This is what's going on with Thomas. You need to keep praying. Her dad, John, never gave up. Gina could have left me easily. I deserved to be left, but she stuck with me, and she stuck it out, and she kept talking to her parents, and they tried to minister to me. I'd call her dad for advice because he seemed to have a wisdom that I didn't have about life. And uh, they said, why don't we go? This is about maybe nine months later. They bring me to First Baptist Woodstock to Johnny Hunt's church to hear Johnny preach. And Johnny had an evangelist named Jerry Vines. Never heard of him. And he had a wooden cross just like this one up on the stage. And he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will never die but have everlasting life. To all who call the name of Jesus, will you come to Jesus today? Jesus loves you. He doesn't want you to go to hell. In fact, he said hell wasn't even created for human beings. It was created for Satan and demons. And so he came to set you free. He does not delight in the death of the wicked. He wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of Jesus. And he said, guys, if you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to be your savior, you've got to climb over the cross to get into hell because he loves you so much. Look to the cross. If you ever wonder how much God loves you, look to the cross. Because when Jesus hung on that cross and he looked out and he died the worst death, if you've never seen Passion of the Christ, I, you know, it's a hard movie to watch. It's hard. It's been a few years since I've watched it. But if we watch that movie this week, you're going to see what it took for the Son of God, the living Jesus who was from heaven to humble himself was without a single sin. And the Bible says he was tempted in every way you and I are tempted in every day. And he never sinned. He, was, he had his eyes on this because he knew that by being nailed to a cross, his hands and feet and the crown of thorns, that he, the Bible says, was going to take, are you ready for this? Every single sin and terrible thing that you and I have ever done, the sin of the entire world, every human being that's ever been born, all of the sin of the world, the Bible says, was laid on Jesus on the cross. And do you want to know what Jesus said on that cross? He looked out. I can't believe this. This is how much God loves you. You know who was on that cross? The Bible says Jesus wasn't just a man and he wasn't just a prophet. My Bible says that he was the son of the living God. And Jesus himself said, I and the Father are one. If you want to know who God is, I'm him. In the flesh, can you imagine walking around with Jesus? The Bible says that he healed the blind. People couldn't walk. He said, get up and walk. Lazarus died. They thought he was too late. He shows up days later, and his sisters are crying. Oh, Jesus, if you'd have just been here, you could have saved your friend Lazarus. And Jesus stands there, and he says, Lazarus, come out of that grave. And he raises Lazarus from the dead. That's my Jesus. He's still doing it today. On that cross, he hung there for you and for me and for all of you that are watching online and hear this message. I want you to know one thing today. He died for you. That Jesus loved you and he said from the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do. You ever feel like God is so far away that you can't even relate to him? Well, my prayer today is that you would experience and feel and know that Jesus is real. So when Jerry Vines gave that invitation to come forward at First Baptist Woodstock, my in-laws, John and John Nett, who had been praying for me, and my wife, Gina, were praying in the spirit, oh, Lord God, let Thomas know who you really are, the God of unconditional love who died for the sins of all people. Would you please let him go forward? But I didn't go. In fact, under my breath, in the pride of my life, in my history of being in my parents' religion, I was never going to go down under those circumstances. 
To their disappointment, not even knowing this was going on because I was not a saved man, my wife and I get in a car to drive home, and my in-laws, who are sitting in this room today, they got in another car to drive to their house. And my mother-in-law, Johnette, said these words, John, what's it going to take for Thomas to get saved? Almost in desperation. You ever prayed for somebody in your life, a, a husband, a wife, a son, a daughter, a grandkid, a neighbor, a coworker? If you have a student that you go to school with, and it seems like the more you pray for them, the worse they get, that was me. In a, in, a, in, a, in a statement of desperation and question, she said to John, who she knows follows Jesus. I don't know many godly men, but I know that my father-in-law loves Jesus. He's not a perfect man, but he's filled with the Spirit. And he believed even when nobody did that I was going to get saved and called to something for the kingdom of God. She said, what's it going to take for Thomas to get saved? He paused, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, he said to her, it's going to take a Damascus Road experience. Thomas is going to have to have an encounter with the living Jesus. And they kept praying. And when, at a time when my wife had every right to leave our marriage, she stuck with me and kept on her knees and started changing her life and started putting on preachers from Calvary Chapel and Greg Laurie and Adrian Rogers and Billy Graham. And a lot of the time I'd curse around and say, get that stupid guy off the television. That's how hardened I was. But she just kept on praying and kept on praising. She didn't let that stop her from praying for me until 17 years ago yesterday. I was in a car from Greenville, South Carolina, driving back to Atlanta, and Gina was sitting next to me, and I had an encounter with the living Jesus. I don't know how to say it. In the Bible, Thomas gets a bad rap for being a doubter, but I'll take it on the face for that one. Maybe I was. Maybe I was. I was a doubter. In fact, I was a total hypocrite. I thought that going to church, reading my Bible was just enough for me to get into heaven. But the truth is, the Bible says you have to confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You must be filled with the Spirit of God and be born again. That's what he said to Nicodemus, who, by the way, in the Bible, went to church. Nicodemus in John 3, he was a church goer, man. He was there every time the doors opened. But he snuck over in the middle of the night and said, Jesus, what is going on? Who are you? How are you able to heal all these people? He was, he was having a discussion, an encounter with Jesus. And Jesus looks at Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and he says to him, Nicodemus, I'll tell you, you got to be born again to see the kingdom of God. You can do all the things that Christianity seemed to think to tell you to do. Christianity is not a list of top 10 things that you're supposed to just do. It's Jesus coming in and crucifying the old you with all of your sins and giving you a new heart and a new life in Jesus through his Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen? You see the difference? I didn't even know. He said, Nicodemus, you gotta be born again to the kingdom of God. I have to come inside of your heart and I have to forgive your sins and I have to put my Holy Spirit inside of your body and Nicodemus, the old you dies and a new life is born in Jesus Christ. So I'm in the car and I have an encounter with the Lord. And here's what Jesus did in that car. Gina's sitting next to me. She doesn't hear the Lord speaking to me, but it's something that she was praying. And for whatever reason in that moment, God began to speak to me and said, Thomas, look at your life. Look at all the stuff that you claim that you are. You're an ordained minister. You're in full-time ministry. You go to church. And yet, I experienced in that moment a separation from God. He said, Thomas, if you were to die tonight, you will die apart from me. For your life is full of sin, and I am not the Lord of your life, and I don't live inside of you. And there is an eternity where you'll be separated from me forever. And it was the first time in my life I thought, I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. Everything that I thought that I had done for the kingdom didn't matter in that moment. You know, the Bible describes a judgment seat that one day each of us are going to face the Lord face to face. And the Bible says you never know when your hour on earth is done. I've done enough funerals to know and did one for a 20-year-old girl uh, last year. A pastor's daughter uh, died in her sleep. Thank God she knew Jesus. 
But if you've ever been to an untimely funeral when somebody dies early, it's a reminder. In fact, the scripture says it's better to go to a house of mourning than a place of celebration because I think in those places of memorial service and funerals, we all have to face one fact. There is an eternity waiting each one of us. And here's the deal. I deserved everything that the Lord was saying by the way I treated my wife, by my own language, by the lust of my life, by my addiction to alcohol. And I was playing church, but I didn't know Jesus. And I, and I remember thinking, I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to be separated. I'll never be in heaven with him. And in that moment, he brought me to John chapter three, when it talked about Nicodemus. And he said, Thomas, here's, here's what I want to offer you today. If you will confess me as Lord of your life, I am the Jesus that died for you and loves you. I died for the sins of every single person in the world. I am the savior of the world. I am the Messiah. And in the Holy Spirit, he said, would you be born again today? And I faced a decision that every human being faces. Did you know in Romans 1, it says nobody goes to hell without, uh, without an excuse. Nobody goes to hell that didn't have an opportunity to trust in him. He says he's made it known through what has been made so that men are without excuse. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 1 that he writes the knowledge of himself on our conscience. So every person in the world knows that there is a creator. But so many people in the world today, out of the 8 billion people, most have never heard that there's a living Jesus that came to die on the cross, rose again from the grave, and that they can trust in him to be Lord and Savior. I faced that moment in that car. Do I continue in religion? Do I continue in the faith of my parents? Do I continue playing the imposter, the hypocrite, treating my wife terribly, not leading people to Jesus, no passion, just religion? Or do I turn from that sin and do I run to the cross and ask Jesus to forgive me. That's the choice I had in that moment. It was the first time I realized that Jesus wasn't just a building or a Bible study or a song, that he was a real living savior that wanted to know me personally and that he loved me. And I just, I can't explain it. But when God speaks to you today and you feel that unconditional love and you feel that tug on your heart, don't resist for it may be your moment to be born again. And I did something that I never imagined I would ever do in that car after seven years of full-time ministry and growing up forever in the church that never drew me close to God. I said, Jesus, would you forgive everything I've ever done against you? I'm a sinner. I'm really messed up. I got a lot of problems and a lot of addictions. Would you come inside of me and forgive everything I've ever done against you? I believe you died on the cross, that you died for my sins and the sins of the world. Jesus, I need you to come in and change me. God, help me. Would you come in? Would you save my soul? And I cried out to that Jesus in that car on April 1st, 2006. And do you know what Jesus did? He saved me. He saved me in that moment. He washed away my sins. The old Thomas died and a new Thomas and Jesus was born. And in that moment, I heard two things from the Lord. I mean, this is crazy. That's a doubting Thomas. I didn't even know Jesus could even speak to you, but he can. He's a real person. When you ask Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes into you, he wants to be involved in every aspect of your life. He cares about you. Somebody came up to me last week and they said, I don't think God cares about anything about what's going on in my life. I said, yes, he does. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. He's been with you since the moment he made you in your mother's womb. He crafted you. Do you know you're the only you in this entire world? You are unique in the image of God. And he wants to save you. He wants to fill you. He wants to send you out to be a light in the dark world. And one day, the Bible says, we will be gathered around the throne of Jesus and people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, and the angels will be singing, worthy is the lamb, holy is the Lord. There's my Jesus, the Jesus that set me free. And in that moment, man, I heard, Thomas, there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Now go and preach my name to the nations. (laughs) I was like, what? I looked at Gina. I said, Gina, I said, Jesus is alive. He's not a religion or a doctrine or a theological whatever. He's like a real living savior. I said, Gina, is this the good news? She goes, yes, Thomas. I said, did you know that I wasn't saved? She goes, yes, Thomas. We've been on our knees for you praying that you would have an encounter with the living Jesus. Oh my goodness. The next day I drove up, literally this is that day yesterday, 17 years ago, I I woke up in the morning and I remember thinking, Gina, can you see the colors? Everything is brighter. I really did say that on the way. I said, we got to drive to Cartersville and I got to tell your parents what just happened to me. 
She says, all right. She hopped in the car. We drove to Cartersville, knocked on the door. My in-laws answered it. They're like, what are you doing here? I said, I have something to tell you. They didn't know what it was. We sit down in their living room, and I said, man, you're not going to believe this, but I gave my life to Jesus last night. It was, it was so good. It was so good. And John stood up from his chair, having believed the entire time they were praying for me for years. He never gave up. You know how Pastor Steve says his pastor never gives up on him? Jesus never gives up on us. He hadn't given up on you. He hadn't given up on you. You may not come from a family that you have unconditional love. Most of us in the church are that way, that get saved. But there's some people in this church that'll love on you. There's some people in this church that have been walking with Jesus. Find somebody in your life that's been walking with Jesus and really loves Jesus. There's some people that are walking with Jesus that have lost their spouses and their kids and their grand, and they're all alone and they're looking for somebody to pour their life into. Find that person. We have discipleship groups starting in, in 10 days. We got five of them. We don't want you just to come to a Bible study. We want you to make an investment in your personal walk with Jesus. There's five different Bible studies that you can sign up for. I don't know about y'all, but I can't do just Sunday to Sunday Christianity. Can I get an amen? It's not enough. I can't just go to church thinking I'm going to be filled and then I'm going to wait six days before I even open my Bible, pray, seek the Lord, witness to somebody, and then hope to get filled up and then I'm empty during the week. Sometimes we need to make investments in our life through daily time in the word, asking Jesus to fill us with his Holy Spirit. And uh, sometimes we need a midweek Bible study to make an investment. I can't think of any better investment in your life, in your marriage, in your family. Drop your kids off, drop your teenagers off. We're gonna give them the gospel and you guys go get the word of God. My father-in-law, by the way, uh, plug, uh, is gonna teach a class on 10 signs of Holy Spirit faith. And I promise you, it'll be awesome. We have a men's Bible study, a women's Bible study, a, a Bible study for those that have just received Jesus and you want a four-week foundation. Just make sure you make that a priority. Drop your kids off, drop your teenagers off. Y'all get the word of God. It'll be awesome. So I tell them, I got saved last night. John stands up. He comes over to me in the house. He gives me a hug. And he says, Thomas, welcome to the kingdom. It was glorious. It was awesome. He believed. We sold a bunch of the stuff that we owned. God called me into full-time evangelism. And John said, look, I'll go with you wherever you want to go. I'm nearing retirement, and I would love to go with you. I'll be your accountability partner. I can help you. I can help train pastors. And for the last 17 years, John and I have traveled over 250,000 miles on four continents in some of the most remote places of the world, in the village huts of India where they worship 150 million gods. We shared the gospel. We built a wooden cross, and we told them that Jesus was the true living God. And 1,700 Hindu villagers turned from their Hindu gods and ran to the stage and to the cross to give their life to Jesus. We've been in the dark places of Haiti where they were worshiping voodoo gods and trying to be filled with false spirits. And we went in there, we, shown, we had one bulb and one generator in a room full of 300 Haitians. And I said, Jay-Z Abvini, Jay-Z Abvini, Jesus is coming. And he's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and the God of love. Turn from your other gods, turn to Jesus. And hundreds and hundreds of Haitians gave their life to Jesus. I'm telling you something. If you've never been on a mission trip, Hear me, you gotta go. This coming uh, September, during fall break for Paulding County, if you have families, and even if you don't have kids, um, we're going to Costa Rica. I suggest you start praying about it because man, when you go to El Salvador, Costa Rica, Uganda, all over the world, you will see that most people around the world not only don't have anything and they're living in village huts, but they were living without hope. And you guys can be the hope givers you don't have to be a pastor to share the gospel. You don't have to be an ordained minister to share the gospel. All you have to do is know Jesus. And if you'll sign up and you'll go on a mission trip, it'll change your life forever. I want to put this verse on the screen really quick. Listen to this. This is 1 Timothy chapter 2, 3 through 6. Listen to this. Listen to this. This is awesome. It says, this is good and it pleases God our Savior. Are you ready for this? Who wants all people to be saved. Did you catch that? This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Thank you, Jesus. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all 
people. So I want y'all to say this with me. Some of y'all have some sweet tattoos. We want to have a spiritual tattoo on our soul today. I said, God, please write this on all of our hearts today. I want you to say it with me. And these are the words. God wants all people to be saved. And I want you to say it with me nice and slow. You ready? God wants all people to be saved. Say it louder. You ready? God wants all people to be saved. You know what I was praying today? God, would you save those in that need to be saved. And for the rest of us who know Jesus and somewhere along the line, the troubles of this world, our own addictions, our own past that we've kind of gotten away from God as Christians, we've lost that fire. We've lost that flame in our hearts. And we need to return back to the Lord today and say, God, you know, uh, Pastor Johnny and Pastor Steve were preaching at the men's conference. I was convicted. Look, y'all, God's working on me still. I walked away from that going, I gotta be a better husband. I gotta be a better godly husband. I need to start praying for my wife more, praying, praying for her. I need to start asking forgiveness more. I need to start leading my family just as passionately as I do those students on Wednesday nights. So don't think that God stops working on you after you receive Jesus. He's still working on me. God convicted me. And um, they said a statement. They said, sometimes as Christians, there's really just one big major sin that's holding us back from God absolutely filling us with the Spirit and sending us out with the fire of evangelism. So whatever that is for you today, whatever that is, get it right. Confess it. There's no greater place than coming here. And when Josh gets up with the worship team uh, in a little bit, uh, you're going to have the opportunity to come down to the altar. One, if you want to receive Jesus. Two, if you need to get right with God today. There's no shame in that. All of us need to come to the throne of Jesus today, right? Jesus says, come to the cross, come as you are, and I will wash away your sins. I, you just confess it to me, and we will get right back on track. And boy, does he have a plan for you that you just can't even imagine. Some of us need to come to the altar today to lift up somebody in our life that doesn't know Jesus by name. You know what the Bible says? The prayers of the righteous are powerful, and they are effective. So I brought the crosses up here today because this cross represents freedom, Freedom from addiction, freedom from religiosity, freedom from our own selves that try to fill that void in our heart with everything else besides Jesus. When you go out to a restaurant, when you go to school, when you go to your workplace, I want you to start seeing people the way Jesus sees them. God wants all people to be saved. Every waitress and waiter that serves you at a restaurant, every person that mows their lawn next door to you, he died for them and loves them. Every coworker that you eat lunch with every day, students, every student, all 16,000 plus of them in Paulding County, Jesus died on the cross for them and he wants to set them free. And I can tell you our students are facing temptation beyond anything I can ever imagine. But what I have seen in our Wednesday nights is an answer to prayer. I prayed uh, nine or 10 months ago on a beach at Big Stuff. I said, Lord Jesus, would you do such a great work? I was only 10 days on staff here at New Season. I said, I wanna see a movement of God among our students. And something began to happen on Wednesday nights. I committed to preach the gospel and give an invitation every Wednesday. And over the course of 10 months, 160 students have given their life to Jesus. Now, that is not a Thomas thing. That's not a T. Dizzle thing. They call me T. Dizzle. Um, that's because I'm trying to stay young, y'all. <laughs> they call me T. Dizzle. And, uh, but what's also happened is our students are starting to bring their lost friends at school to Wednesday night. Here's what I prayed. God, every time those doors open, every time I see a visitor, we had 14 teenage visitors three weeks ago. They come through the door, and I said, I want them from the moment they walk in to feel the unconditional love of God. I want them to know the God that created them, no matter what abusive relationships with their parents they come from or all the tragedies in their life. I want them to hear the hope of salvation. I want them to know Jesus the way that I knew him and accepted him 17 years ago. I want for them what John and Johnette and Gina wanted for me and prayed for me to have. And do you know that almost every Wednesday with a group of 18 to 20 other adult leader volunteers, which by the way, I could not do that student ministry without. They give four or five hours of their work week every Wednesday to set up the pizza to set up the sign and to come lead those small groups and we're looking for God to move. So be praying for that generation. You know, the same way Pastor Steve 
And, and, and Pastor Shane and all of us, we pray for this congregation, for you guys, that there would be such a movement of God in this church that it would be undeniable to everybody in Paulding County, everybody in Georgia, that a fire would begin that's so great in this building and through you guys being on fire for Jesus that the whole world will be reached for Jesus. Can I get an amen? That's what I'm praying. Jesus wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. I have found no greater joy. There's four things that I want you to think about as we close today. Four points, four questions that I want us to ask ourselves. Number one, am I walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? What does that mean, Thomas? Here's what it means. You can't save anybody. Do you hear me? Jesus saves souls. But through the power of his spirit that lives inside of us, Jesus said, I'm going to send you out to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I've commanded you. And behold, listen, Jesus says, I'm going to be with you even to the end of the age. So guess who's with you every time you know Jesus? Jesus his spirit, the spirit of Jesus. Did you know that the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit, is the same, according to the Bible, the same Holy Spirit that lives inside of you when you're born again and you know Jesus? Can I get an amen for that? And yet what's crazy is when we accept Jesus, a lot of people look at us, and if we're complaining about life, we're like, man, life stinks, man. I hate it. I thought you said you go to church at New Season. Yeah, I do, but I just hate life. Why would somebody want to be like that? And I'm not saying to pretend that you're not going through trials, but if you're going through trials, you still have hope But because Jesus has not given up on you and he says, I will walk you through this trial. And when people see you praising Jesus in the midst of your struggles, in the midst of your problems, in the midst of your addictions, he said, I don't know much, but I'm praying to Jesus every day that God's gonna help me through this. How do you have hope? People that have lost their husbands and wives, we have a staff member, Amanda Goss, who's in stage four cancer and you would never know it because when we went on the staff retreat, she's fighting for her life and she was the loudest one singing praise praises to Jesus in that staff retreat. And I think, do I have faith like Amanda? If I had stage four cancer, she has a son, she has twin boys, one has cerebral palsy, and she's a single mom. And every week she's texting us all this medical stuff that's going on. But at the end of every one of those reports, she's saying, but I believe my God is gonna heal me. I believe in my creator. I'm praising Jesus. That's the kind of faith that we need. And that's the kind of faith that the world needs. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit of God? One, if you don't know Jesus and you don't have the Spirit of God in you, trust in him today. Don't leave this. Don't be worried about where you're going for lunch. This may be your moment, so don't miss it. Am I filled with the Holy Spirit? Am I walking in his power? Number two, am I ready to share the gospel today with somebody who really needs it? Y'all, can I just get real? First of all, we all need Jesus. He's not, you know what Jesus said in John 3, after John 3, 16? I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but I came into the world to save the world. I'm gonna say it again, because some of y'all need to hear this today. Some of you online, some of you in this building need to hear it. God did not come to condemn you. In fact, the Bible says he does not delight in the death of the wicked. He came to the cross to set you free so that you would never enter hell. He's paved the way to heaven, and it's not by works, and it's not by how many times you go to church. It's by saying, Jesus, I can't. God, I can't do this anymore. I've tried to fill my life with everything else, but Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I'm a mess, but Jesus, I'm just gonna come to the cross today, and I wanna be saved. Would you come inside of me? I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I wanna receive eternal life. And guess what he does? Instantly, you're saved. Hallelujah. Doesn't matter what you look like, what you're skinning, tone is, whether you're rich or poor, whether you grew up in this religion or that religion, whatever your addictions are, come to the cross. Jesus is here to set you free today. Hallelujah. Praise God. Am I ready to share the gospel today with somebody that needs it? Number three, do I have a burden in my heart for the lost and is it enough for me to do something about it? Don't underestimate how God can use you to lead somebody to Jesus. People in the world, you know a statistic had this 87 to 95% of professing Christians in the world the, uh, through these four studies I read said that they'll go to the grave without ever sharing their faith with any single other person. And I thought, dude, there's no way. Because we have a Jesus that can set people free. We have to share. Jesus is saying, go make other followers of Jesus. Go tell them that I do love them. Now listen, I get it. 
A lot of people are gonna say, no, you might be rejected. You might be praying for people and they seem to get worse just like I did. But my in-laws and my wife never gave up on me. And eventually because of their prayers, the prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. God eventually got a hold of me in a very, very personal way that was undeniable. And I gave my life to Jesus. I've got family members that don't know Jesus. I've got friends that don't know Jesus. But one thing that I will not do is go to sleep and never say a word to them. I've gone, when I got saved, I went to every single family member and on both sides of the family and shared about what Jesus had did for me. Now, most of them were like, good for you, Thomas. That's not for me. But I didn't take that personal. I just put them on my prayer list and I'm still praying for them today. Two of them got saved. Two people got saved. My friends most of them left, said, Thomas, that's good for you, but we like the way we're living. If you're not going to party with us anymore, then that's fine. Good for you. You're a Jesus guy now. Um, but a couple years later, one of those close, close friends called me and said, Thomas, I was listening uh, to one of your messages, and I gave my life to Jesus today. I said, praise God. See, so, so don't be afraid of rejection, but sometimes we just need to open our mouths and say, God, would you send opportunities in front of me? Our pastor's wife, Vicki Flockhart, texted me Tuesday. She says, me and Shelly Curtis, which is our executive pastor's wife, they were on their way to the airport and they had an Uber driver and her name was Berta. Now they could have been busy looking at, you know, whatever, or their phones or going on social media, but, but Vicki honed in on Berta and began to share and look for an opportunity to share the gospel. So she began to share with Berta how Jesus died on the cross for her, how he loved her so much, and how she could have eternal life. And before that airport ride was done, right, Miss Vicky, Berta gave her life to Jesus. Isn't that awesome? And she sent me a selfie. Y'all know how much I love selfies with the students. It's ridiculous, I know. But, but I do that because I want those students and I want people to feel special. And so she did a selfie and sent it to me. She was looking for the opportunity to share Jesus. Number four, as we close... Does it bother me that people around me will spend eternity in hell if they don't trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Guys, I just can't stand the thought of anybody being in hell when Jesus came to keep them out of hell. So all that God is asking us to do, he's the only one that can save them, but we're the only people that can tell them. Does that make sense? To make disciples is to open your mouth and share the good news. In Romans 10, it says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it's that simple. Don't be a robot. Just ask them, what's your favorite sports team? And hopefully they'll say Georgia Bulldogs. But if they don't, you can, there's still hope for them. Um, you just talk to them about what they're interested in. How many kids do you have? Tell me about your job. Tell me about your life. Be interested in each individual person the way that God is, and then look for the open door. That's an instruction. Look for the open door. Sometimes it's a little bit more bold. I was in the foyer, and there was a girl in our youth group that had got saved, and her mother was there in the foyer. And I said, hey, isn't it awesome that your daughter just got saved? She goes, yes. I'm, I'm amazed. I mean, it's changed her life. And then something came over me from the Holy Spirit. I said, what do you think about Jesus? And she welled up with tears, this mom she says, I can't believe you just asked me that, Thomas. I said, why? I was praying this morning as I was getting ready to come to church, and I said to the Lord, Lord, I don't feel like I really know you. I feel so disconnected from you. I don't know if I'm even in a relationship with you. I said, wow, thanks for sharing that with me. I got some good news for you. You can know Jesus right now before the service even begins. And I shared the gospel with, I said, would you like to pray to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And I grabbed another member of our church. We came into the auditorium before the 11 o'clock service even started. We joined hands, and she asked Jesus to be her Lord and Savior, and she got baptized last week with her son. Man, that's my Jesus. Listen, uh, y'all, Jesus is coming, and the Bible says in heaven he's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. Can I get an amen? amen? There will be no death. There will be no suffering there will be no abuse, there will be no sickness, there will be no cancer, there will be no alcoholism, there will be no drug addiction. My Bible says that when we see Jesus face to face, we will be met with a brand new body and we will be like him in the presence of our Savior and we will lay the crowns at his feet. We don't get any glory for leading anybody to faith in Jesus. That's all the work of the Holy Spirit. We'll just be glad that they're there. Nobody ever gets to heaven and says, man, I wish I hadn't led so many people to Jesus. Nobody ever says that. So I say, I had this saying with our youth group. I said, let's make heaven full. Let's bring as many students as we can into the kingdom of God. I got a video Friday morning that one of our seniors was supposed to go work at Chick-fil-A, but Paulding County High School asked him to come speak to an FCA group. 
So he called his boss. He said, listen, I got to go do this work. He preaches in 12 minutes the gospel about the need for Jesus, gives an invitation. Five students give their life to Jesus. Now, here's what's exciting about that is that God doesn't want to just see us be saved. And that's an amazing thing. But, but when you start to see students in our ministry leading other students to Jesus, that's the end game. That's why Pastor Steve, when he gets up here, you know what he says to us all the time in our staff meetings? I just want, I just want the people of New Season to catch fire for Jesus. I want them to be soul winners. I want them to go out to their workplace. I want them to know the joy. I want them to go on a mission. He's begging you to go on a mission trip with them because he wants you to see and experience what it's like to watch people that have nothing, who are hopeless, who are living on less than a dollar a day to hear this message about a Jesus that stepped out of heaven and it's been 2,000 years and they never even heard about him. He wants you to see and touch the hands of these little children that run up to me and John and they're like, hey, and I had a lady in Haiti grab my hand after I gave an invitation. And she said, would you please thank whoever sent you to us in this village back in America? She goes, did you know the life expectancy of somebody in Haiti is like 42 years old? And she was at the end of her life. She goes, I know I'm going to die soon. But I was praying that if there was a heaven, that somebody would be sent to tell us how to get there. And today I gave my life to Jesus. So thank whoever sent you to us to share this message. Can I get a praise and a Hallelujah. Man, and it doesn't just happen in Costa Rica and El Salvador and Africa and India the way that I've seen it, but I encourage you, go on a mission trip, get in a discipleship group on Wednesday. Don't just make church the only deposit of spirituality that you have in your life. Get close with Jesus. And we're gonna close, but we're not done because Jesus has some work to do this morning. You know, I never know if tomorrow's gonna come. I never know. When Gina sends her dad and I off to the mission field, she does that by faith. I have three beautiful children, and she does that knowing that we may not come back. But she believes that people around the world need Jesus, and as long as I got a call of, of God on my life, I need to go share the gospel. And, and that's what Jesus wants you to know. Last verse, and then I'm going to pray. Philemon, on the way to Sierra Leone, West Africa, God gave this verse to my father-in-law, and I don't think he had ever really meditated upon it, but I'm gonna end with this. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. That means sharing the gospel, sharing the love of God, telling people how much God loves them, telling them that, that, that they don't have to be alone, that Jesus can give them eternal life. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Jesus Christ. If you really wanna know about Jesus, Give him your life today. Be born again. If you know Jesus, but you haven't been sharing your faith, start sharing your faith. Nothing will grow your faith more than when you start witnessing to people, even when you go to lunch today, minister to your waiter or waitress. Maybe they need Jesus today. We've come to the conclusion of the message, but here's the deal. Don't leave without trusting in Jesus. If you're watching online, if you're here today, maybe you're like I was before that day that I had an encounter with Jesus. I hope that right now you'll have an encounter with Jesus. Are you holding on to something from your past? Would you let Jesus forgive that sin? If somebody abused you, if somebody told you about God and condemned you, this Jesus that was hanging on the cross, he's here to forgive you. He rose from the grave to wash away your sins. And if you'll call on him as Lord and Savior today. So I know we do this every week and I know it's easy to think about where you're going to lunch, but this is a holy moment between you and the living God. And I'm gonna give you an invitation much like the one that I give every single Wednesday at youth group and watch 160 teenagers born again into the kingdom of God. I believe that there are people here in this auditorium and you need Jesus. You know that God's speaking to you. You haven't been the dad you need to be, the husband you need to be, the wife you need to be. If you're a dad and you're not leading your wife in the word of God and praying for her and leading your kids in the name of Jesus, then come to Jesus today and get it right. If you've got an addiction to drugs or alcohol or pornography or you have a history of abusive behavior, lay it at the cross today and Jesus will set you free. If you want freedom, it's here, but you gotta make a decision and you have to surrender to the Lord. That's the first prayer. The second prayer is for anybody that knows Jesus. You know that you know that you know that you've been born again, but you've lost the fire. You lost the fire. You don't have an urgency in your heart. You stopped praying for those that are in your life that are lost. You stopped praying for opportunities. Ask God to reignite the fire in your heart today. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Let's go before the Lord. This is gonna be an awesome, holy moment. Don't worry, the restaurants will still be open. But don't miss this holy moment. You know what? 
There's a verse in the scripture and Jesus was kind of talking through this and, and you read about the story. It said, today your soul may be required of you. None of us know if tomorrow's coming. So today, now is the time of salvation. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I'm gonna make it really simple. Jesus loves you. You don't have to hold on anymore. You don't have to keep filling that place in your heart with other stuff. Let Jesus fill that void. The Bible says he stepped out of heaven. He was crucified on a wooden cross, just like the one on the stage. And his hands and his feet were nailed. They put a crown of thorns. He was lashed and beaten. And the Bible says that your sins and my sins and every bad thing that we've ever done was laid upon Jesus on the cross. And he shed his blood to forgive the whole world of everything they've ever done to forgive their sins and to forgive your sins. He did that for you. And if you were the only one on this earth, Jesus would have come just to die for you. Are you ready to meet Jesus? The Bible says they put him in a tomb. He died on that cross to forgive you. And on the third day, the Bible says, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, Jesus came back from the dead. He resurrected and he says, all who call upon my name shall be saved. And if you'll call on him today, like I did in that car 17 years ago yesterday, he'll do the same for you. Don't miss this. If Jesus is tapping on your heart, if he's pulling you, if you feel that tug, it's coming from Jesus. And he's saying this to you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I've been waiting for this moment your whole life. Would you just trust in me? Take a leap of faith. And you just come as you are. You don't have to get yourself cleaned up before you come to the cross. You just come as you are. Would you, would you pray this with me if you want to ask Jesus to save you today and be filled with this Holy Spirit, be born again. Just cry out to the Lord. You can repeat this out loud, whisper it in your heart, but say this to the Lord. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins and everything I've ever done against you. Jesus, forgive me, I'm letting go. I ask Jesus that you would be my Lord and my Savior today. I believe that you died and were buried and on the third day, I believe you came back from the grave. And I confess you today as the Lord of my life and my personal Savior. Jesus, Come inside of me to live. Please give me your Holy Spirit. Come live inside of me. I turn from that sin and I run into your arms today to receive the love and the eternal life that you have given me today. Thank you for saving me from hell and giving me your spirit, forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. God's still speaking to you. But it was We are so excited that today you decided to join us online. We hope today that you were encouraged and blessed by the Word of God and encouraged today to walk with God in a deeper, more intimate way. For some of you, you just prayed that prayer with us. You just invited Jesus Christ to come into your heart. And if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, do you realize that Jesus just saved you? Your sins just got forgiven. And that is the greatest thing in all the world. Matter of fact, the Bible says that all of heaven throws a party because you just said yes to Jesus Christ. And so we wanna encourage you to read the Bible, to pray, to find you a, a church home that you may be involved in or even on this online campus we've got going on here. Or I want to encourage you, if you just prayed that prayer, to let us know about that. Matter of fact, you can text your response to 470-509-5139. I want to encourage you to do that right now. Don't wait. You don't have to think about it. If you just pray that prayer, Text that response to us and let us know, and then we will get back with you and help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Again, thanks for watching us online.